I'd like to introduce you to uh, Reverend Dr. Joel Heck. Um, we won't have video of, of his sort of face talking. Uh, we have a picture of him in the corner, but we decided that it would be better to be actually be able to see the um, the uh, recording, or, or I'm sorry, um, we figured it would be better to be able to see the, his PowerPoint presentation than just, you know, his face talking. And uh, so that's what you're going to be able to see here. And um, but you will be able to hear him uh, talking, and uh, and he's going to give his presentation. Following the presentation, um, we will have a question and answer session. So if you if you think of anything, feel free to grab a piece of paper and uh, write down any questions that you have. Uh, we also those who are watching online uh, can use uh, either if you're logged in at the acrobat.com site. Um, there's a chat box there. You can just log in as a guest and um, and use that. Uh, which, by the way, if anybody's watching uh, via the uh, UStream feed, uh, you can. Um, there's a link on at uh, shepherdtheridge.org under the Genesis section where you can get a slightly better quality uh, uh, image. And uh, and then you can just log in there as a guest. And there's a comment box there that you can use. If you have questions, and then any questions that are uh, posted either that way or if you're using Twitter, uh, you can uh, use the hashtag SOTR Genesis and post questions that way. I will pass them on to him as they come in. And then um, as soon as he's done with his presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. Any questions that anybody's posted, um, we'll make sure to go through those. And also, anybody that has uh, questions here, um, we, I will pass those on as well. Um, so at this time, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Heck. He is... Uh, I lost my page. Here we go. Um, he teaches courses in Old Testament and New Testament and Reformation at Concordia University in Texas in Austin. And uh, which is actually where he is right now. We are in North Ridgeville, Ohio, at Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church, and um, and so I'm I'm just going to at this time I'm just going to hand it over to him, and uh, and go ahead. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, and I hope that. Uh, all of you will enjoy the presentation and learn a good deal about the book of Genesis. If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to open your Bibles to the first chapter of Genesis, where we are going to begin with the so-called book of beginnings. A lot of people call Genesis the book of beginnings for some obvious reasons. It's the beginning of the universe and everything in it, but that sort of is too much of a simple summary statement just to run off a few of the other things that are specified in the book of Genesis. It is the beginning of the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the human race, all plant life, all animal life, occupations, especially farming and shepherding in the early chapters of Genesis with Cain and Abel, the beginning of the family, the city, metalworking, the beginning of nations, the beginning of languages, and we could go on and on if we sat down and talked about all the different things that are showing up in the book of Genesis as beginning for the very first time. I want to outline the book of Genesis for you in a couple of ways this afternoon. First of all, with an eight-word outline, as you see there on your screen, words creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. That's an eight-word summary of the book. The first four words summarize the first 11 chapters of Genesis, giving us what some people call primeval history, that early history, and I'm talking about it as history because I really believe the book of Genesis is a book of history. It's not a book of legend, saga, myth, or anything else. The last 39 chapters give us the stories of the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, great-grandfather, grandfather, father, and son. So the last four words summarize those last 39 chapters of the book of Genesis. As we get into exact text of the book of Genesis, there's another outline that Genesis itself provides for us. For the first time, it appears in Genesis 2, verse 4, this English word account in the NIV generations in the King James Version and probably translated differently in other translations. This is the account of the heavens and the earth. 
That word account, the Hebrew word toledot, appears 11 times in the book of Genesis, the second time in chapter 5, verse 1, as you see on your screen. And then I have the other places listed where that phrase occurs. Each one of these phrases seems to be an introduction to the material that follows. Some take this phrase as editorial work from Moses, tying together written documents that he had received from others. They point out that while Moses is mentioned in the New Testament as the author of Exodus and Deuteronomy, none of the New Testament writers ever cite him as the author of Genesis. And so this proposal is that Moses wrote this phrase, this is the account of, and inserted it in between two other written accounts in order to tie them together. Whether that's the case or not, whether Moses wrote all of the book or just edited these phrases, these existing materials, isn't really all that important to us. This is a book that comes from the hand of God, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look especially at its message. Next, looking at the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. There are a number of themes that show up in these opening two chapters, uh, first of which is God's oneness. In the creation account in Genesis 1, God has no spouse or consort, as is the case in other pagan mythologies. God is one, so there is an emphasis upon the oneness of God. Secondly, there is a line of distinction between God, the creator, and his creation. Mesopotamian chronologies, the remote ancestors of their rulers, are divine beings. And so there, that line of distinction between creator and creature is blurred. Also true in some religions today, such as pantheism, which blur the line between God and his creation. Third theme, out of six themes that I'm going to highlight, is that God is multiple in his nature. He is one, but he is also multiple. There are indications in the text of Genesis that God is multiple, such as in verse 26 where we read, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, there have been various theories that have arisen in order to explain this language, the us word, let us make man in our image. The mythological interpretation is that one pagan god were speaking to another, and the Bible is borrowing from that, that God is speaking to the earth or to the angels. But the most logical, most plausible explanation, I think, is that it is reflecting plurality in the Godhead. Not as clearly as we will see in the New Testament with the doctrine of the Trinity, but it is there in embryo in the first chapter of Genesis. The fourth theme that shows up in these opening chapters is that God is moral and holy. Now the word holy especially refers to that which elicits in the worshiper both fear and fascination. In scripture, the word holy means set apart, and indeed all of God's creation in that sense is holy. And we also see that emphasis showing up in the last words of the first chapter, where it says that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Goodness of creation is not specifically or not exclusively a moral or a holy goodness, but it is certainly included in the idea of God's goodness and goodness of creation. Fifth theme describes for us God's great power. Genesis 1, we see a picture of effortless creation. God speaks and it happens. And there is no antagonism, there is no resistance as, for example, in the Babylonian creation story. God speaks and effortlessly, it seems, things come into existence. The last theme of the opening chapter in particular, but also coming up again in the second chapter, is that you and I are created in the image of God. Many people have written luminously about the image of God. I understand the image of God as that which separates human beings from animals, things such as a sense of right and wrong, again, going back to God's moral morality and holiness. The ideas of rationality, the ability to communicate, and especially the ability to live in relationship with God. We move on from the first two chapters of Genesis, which, as I suggested earlier, I take as being historical and two accounts that do not contradict one another. The second chapter does not have a different order of creation as the first chapter has, though some people claim that, falsely so, I believe. We move into the story of the fall of Adam and Eve and the sin. In Genesis chapter 3, we have the story of that fall. 
where Adam and Eve are tempted to fall by Satan and do succumb to that temptation. But no sooner have Adam and Eve committed the very first sins than God promises to send a Savior. I believe a proper understanding of the third chapter of Genesis in the 15th verse is that it is predicting an individual, a descendant of this woman Eve, who will one day conquer Satan and crush the head of the serpent. See an echo of that in the last chapter of the book of Romans, by the way. So we have the story of the fall and the sin, and then subsequent to that, in the next eight chapters, we have the consequences of that fall, with three themes in particular showing up in Genesis 4 through 11. And actually those themes show up in Genesis 3 as well. But here are the three saint themes. There is a story of a sin that is committed, as in the eating of the forbidden fruit. There is a message of judgment that Adam and Eve will be cursed in those places that especially mark them as male and female. But God has also offered them a word of grace, and that, in Genesis 3, is the promise of a Savior. As we move on from Genesis 3, we see other examples of this threefold theme of sin, judgment, and grace. So you see, for example, in the story of Genesis 4, the sin is Cain killing Abel. The judgment is God's condemnation that sin, and Cain is condemned to wander. He will not be able to stay in any one place, but God's grace that is placed upon him is the mark that pre pre prevents people from killing him because he is such a vagabond. We also see these themes showing up in Genesis 11 and 12, and I could go into other stories inside of Genesis 4 to 11, the story of Lamech, the story of the sons of God and the daughters of men, the story of the flood, the story of Ham and Canaan. But I'm going to conclude this emphasis on these themes in Genesis 11 and 12, where the sin by the people in Mesopotamia is the refusal to scatter at the Tower of Babel incident. Judgment is when God confuses their languages, and grace is the call of Abram. Some people have wondered whether the early chapters of Genesis conveyed the idea that people actually lived to be hundreds of years old. Genesis 5 and 11 especially list the ages of patriarchs at their death as well as the ages that they were when their children were born. Many people wonder if they lived that long in those days or maybe time was reckoned differently then than it is now. This chart suggests that we ought to take those figures literally in harmony with taking other portions of Genesis as narrative history. This chart also suggests the gradual effect of the curse that came into the world with the first sin. Further, we read into the book of Genesis, the younger the patriarchs and other figures of Genesis are at the age of their deaths. Notice how the curve moves rather gradually through the 50 chapters of Genesis, with the greater ages appearing early in the book, the younger ages appearing later in the book. I want to suggest a couple of resources to you, a couple of books, one of which I contributed a chapter to that was published in 1986 and then reprinted by another publisher in 1990, The Genesis Debate. It's subtitled Persistent Questions in Genesis 1 through 9. Ronald Youngblood is the editor. And uh, one of the questions that is raised in that book and answered is the question, did people live to be hundreds of years old before the flood? Now, this book presents both sides of the coin, so there is an article that answers that question, yes, and there's another article that answers the question, no. My article has to do with the reason for Cain's sacrifice being rejected by God in Genesis 4, but I won't go further into that, but I commend that book to you. It's probably out of print, but it's probably available also as a used book. Another book that I want to mention is a much more recent book by John Sanford with a somewhat uh, difficult title, or at least intimidating title, Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Human Genome. Dr. Sanford from Cornell University in this book shows the impact of the curse in our own genetic code and suggests that there are negative or harmful mutations that affect us over the centuries and from generation to generation. 
and the existence of those mutations in our genetic code show that the universe and the human race has to be relatively young rather than old. But let's move on from that portion of the story and get into the story of the flood. We've talked about the creation, the fall, now we're getting into the third word of our eight-word outline of the book of Genesis, the flood. The flood story illustrates how the corruption of mankind resulted in fractured relationships throughout the entire earth, not just between the sons of God and the daughters of men, or between husband and wife, or between brother and brother. Sin is described in Genesis 6, verse 5, and sin had become so rampant that God decided to bring the human race to an end with the exception of Noah and his family. Judgment, then, is but itself, which destroys everything that has breath, and then the grace shows up in the preservation of Noah and his family. Central teaching of the story of the flood in Genesis 8, verse 1, where we read these words, but God remembered Noah and everything that Noah had taken into the ark. And the remembering that appears in Genesis 8 is not just a jogging of the memory. It is a remembering that includes protection and preservation. And so while the flood is very much about the loss of human life and animal life, God's judgment upon the human race because of their sin, its central teaching is the rescuing of Noah and his family and how God begins again. This was not a local flood, but a universal flood. Read Genesis 7, verses 19 and 20 states that all the high mountains and the entire heavens were covered. I want to show with this slide how the structure of the story of the flood narrative indicates that the flood narrative is unified, but also shows us that central teaching that I mentioned in our last slide. First, it makes the central theme that of remembering Noah by placing that Theme, that idea right in the middle of the story. You'll notice this last click of my mouse will put the central teaching right in the middle of the two halves of the story, God's remembrance of Noah. But if you're able to see this slide very well, you'll notice the first and the tenth points are exact opposites. The second and the ninth are exact opposites. Number two, for instance, being God's resolution to destroy. Number nine being God's resolution to preserve order. So we have a series of five stair steps leading up to the remembering of Noah, the protection of Noah and his family. And then we have five stair steps stepping down. And those last five steps are the exact opposite of the first half of the story, thereby showing not only the central teaching, but also the unity of the story is coming from the same author. According to Genesis 8, verse 4, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And this is an internet photo that I was able to glean of one particular peak, Mount Ararat. The Hebrew does say the mountains of Ararat, so we can't say for sure that this is the precise place where the ark landed. I know that many people have attempted to find the ark of Noah, and a lot of people have written about it, some claiming to have seen it. They find it. I think that's wonderful. If they do not find it, it's not going to affect my faith one bit at all. But I do believe that we are looking at a story that is very historical and foundation, and every detail of the story is historical as well. And so whether the ark exists or not, the events as related in Genesis 6 to 9 have, did take place in history. I want to say a word now also about the extinction of the dinosaurs because the dinosaurs would have been on the ark, not fully grown, of course, but the dinosaurs would have become extinct after the flood because of the dramatic change in climatic conditions. Some people do not realize that reptiles are the only animal that keeps growing throughout its entire life. So the much larger sizes of dinosaurs for which we have fossils would be dinosaurs that had lived many, many decades, maybe even hundreds of years, in order to achieve that size. So it's very possible for Noah to take very small dinosaurs, infant dinosaurs, on the ark and to have room for them. He wouldn't have to take a 
full grown, full grown, full grown Brontosaurus or Tyrannosaurus Rex. And very few people also know that the word dinosaur didn't even exist before 1841. That word simply means terrible lizard was coined in that year, 1841, and therefore inside of that term dinosaur, we have a reflection of the fact that dinosaurs are in fact lizards. Now evolutionists have about 16 different explanations for their extinction, but here's my own theory for the extinction of dinosaurs. I just want to put it up on the screen for you there. I think that this is the real reason why dinosaurs became extinct. Probably lung cancer followed the, the beginning of their smoking, and so we have the end of the dinosaurs in uh, human history. I want to also commend a book for you to you that uh, is a good deal of a close look at the story of the flood and Noah's Ark. John Woodenrapp wrote this book in 1996. It's still very much a state-of-the-art study for a few topics about this book addresses which animals were taken on the ark, was there room for them, how eight people cared for the animals, did some of them go into hibernation, and the like. And so if you're interested in reading more about Noah's Ark, a couple hundred page study of the ark and the flood shows up in John Woodenrapp's book, and I recommend that book to you. We come to the fourth and last word of our first half of our outline, the table of nations. This is the listing of nations that show up in Genesis chapter 1. And this chapter is placed here for literary reasons, as you see on your screen. In other words, these events occur chronologically after the Tower of Babel incident. But this table was placed before the Tower of Babel incident so that the narrator could tell us about the Tower of Babel and then move right directly into the story of Abram and God calling of Abram in order to highlight this as God's act of grace after the sin of Mesopotamians refusal to scatter, the judgment in the confusion of the languages, and God's word of grace comes in the calling of Abram. In this table of nations, we have three major peoples, the Shemites, the Hamites, and the Japhethites. Shemites, indicating the Semitic peoples, but not just them. Hamites, descendants of Noah's son Ham, especially African and Mesopotamian peoples, and then Japheth, who was the father of especially the European and Asian peoples, all of them coming from Noah, and of course, Noah coming ultimately from Adam and Eve. Now we get into the second major part of the book of Genesis. We've covered creation, fall, flood, and nations. Now we're going to take a look at the last 39 chapters. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The story of Abraham appears in Genesis 11 through 25. I especially want to focus in on the call of Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, which contains the very first statement about the worldwide application of the gospel. Genesis 12, 1, God gives a command to Moses. Then verses 2 and 3, continues with five promises from God, five statements, all of which begin with the words, I will. I will make, I will bless, I will make great, I will bless, I will curse. Then this call ends with one prediction, that in you and in your descendants will all the nations on earth be blessed. In Genesis 12, 1, God says, go to the land I will show you. Genesis 12, verse 3, he says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And in Galatians 3, verse 8, St. Paul explicitly makes the point, based on the passive of the verb form, that the blessing for all people will come from the outside. Mankind will not bless itself. Some English translations in Genesis 12, verse 3, translate the verb as though, all peoples on earth would bless themselves through you, but no, it is specifically the passive voice of the verb. That's a reference to the gospel, which becomes clear if you look up Galatians 3, verse 8 in its context. One Old Testament scholar, Hans Walter Wolf, contrasts the five blessings of Genesis 12, 1 to 3 
a fivefold cursing in Genesis 1 to 11. Genesis 3.14, serpent is cursed above all the livestock. Genesis 3.17, Adam is, the ground is cursed because of Adam's sin. Chapter 4, verse 11, God says to Cain, now you are under a curse. Chapter 5, verse 29, the ground is described as having been cursed. And then in chapter 9, verse 25, Canaan is indicated as having been cursed. In the calling of Abram, then, God has intervened to bless everyone who has ever lived since that time, beneficiary of that blessing, either because they have believed that gospel message or because they have benefited from the lifestyle and the commitment of those who have believed the discoveries, writings, so many other things that the people of God have produced for our culture over the last several thousand years. We move on to the life of Abraham. Starting in chapter 12, after his call out of Ur of the Chaldees in southern Mesopotamia to northern Mesopotamia and eventually to Canaan, Abraham and his wife Sarah traveled to Egypt because of famine in the land of Canaan and Syria. Chapter 13, Abraham and Sarah come back from Egypt, and now we find Abraham and Lot must separate their, their possessions are growing larger and larger and they need to divide themselves, parcel out the land between them. So Abraham gives Lot the choice of the territory that he wants to settle in and he settles in the plains area around the Dead Sea, a place that we will meet again later on in the story of Genesis as Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham was a man of faith in allowing Lot to take his pick of the territory he wanted to live in. Chapter 14, we have the story of four Mesopotamian kings gathering together and coming into the land of Canaan and attacking the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and other cities of that area and capturing many of the people of that territory. Abraham comes to the rescue with his soldiers and chases after those four kings, defeats them with just 318 warriors of his own, rescues Lot, and allows Lot to return. Home. It's in this story that Abraham meets Melchizedek, king of Salem and also a priest, and offers a tithe to Melchizedek. The word Salem, by the way, is a, an abbreviated version of the city named Jerusalem, the last five letters of Jerusalem being the five letters of Salem. And you may also note a similarity between the word Salem and the Hebrew word Shalom, means peace. Jerusalem is supposed to be a city of peace, even though for much of its history it was not. Moving on from chapter 14, we come to chapter 15, where God establishes the covenant with Abraham in a very unusual vision that Abraham has, in which Abraham cuts an animal in half, in fact, several animals in half, and sets them apart two halves apart and walks between those two halves, suggesting that he is committing himself to Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of the universe, and may what happened to those animals happen to Abraham if he fails to keep up this bargain. So the covenant is established in chapter 15 between God and Abraham, though God called him to serve him in chapter 12. Chapter 16 we have Abraham listening to the advice of his wife, Sarah. They have been promised an heir. Abraham does not have an heir. And so Sarah suggests that Abraham sleep with Hagar and have a child by him. So Ishmael is born as a result of this union. Ishmael, who becomes the father or the ancestor of the Arab tribes. Chapter 17 tells us the story of the sealing of the covenant of chapter 15 with the rite of circumcision, which in the Old Testament is the Old Testament correspondence to the New Testament sacrament of baptism. Circumcision was to happen on the eighth day in infancy for the male, and because husband and wife are one flesh in marriage, it's only necessary for a circumcision to apply to one or the other, and so it applies to the male. Moving on to chapters 18 and 19, 
See, things have gone from bad to worse in the Sodom and Gomorrah area, southern Dead Sea area, in the land of Israel. God has noticed the wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so three people come to visit Abraham in his tents in the afternoon. Two of them end up going down to Sodom and Gomorrah and destroying those two cities after Lot and his wife and his daughters escape from the city. And, of course, this is the story where Lot's wife carries and so dies in the process. Abraham intercedes for Sodom and Gomorrah, praying that God would allow them to be spared if there were only ten righteous people found there, but there were not even ten. And so God rained his judgment down upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Moving on to chapter 20, we have the story of Abraham, now away from home, once again, trying unsuccessfully to deceive a king a second time, as he had done earlier in chapter 20, by calling Sarah his sister. Chapters 21 and 22 tell us of the birth of Isaac, and then that great story in the 22nd chapter, where God tells Abraham to take Isaac, his only son, by Sarah and the child of Thomas, off of him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Interestingly, Mount Moriah is the very geographical location where later on Solomon will build his temple. Abraham takes Isaac there and takes him to the top of the mountain builds an altar, binds Isaac, and is about to plunge his knife into Isaac's chest when the angel of the Lord says to Abraham, don't do that now, I have the test has proven to me and to you that you have faith and you trust in me. Prior to this time, Abraham had not been all that faithful, but from this point on in the narrative, Abraham never again fails to trust in God and to believe his promises. And so Isaac is spared. If you're interested, you may want to take a look at the 11th chapter of Hebrews to see what God has to say, perhaps not now, but perhaps uh, later on today, to see what God has to say about the faith of Abraham, because the writer of the Hebrews indicates that Abraham had believed a faith that God would raise this very son Isaac back to life again after Abraham slayed him and offered him as a sacrifice. Chapter 23, we have the story of the death of Sarah. Chapter 24, Abraham sends his servant Eliezer to Mesopotamia to obtain a bride for Isaac, so that Isaac will be able to marry within the family and not marry one of the pagan Canaanites that live in the territory where Abraham lives. And then finally we get to the story of the end of Abraham's life, his death, and the opening verses of Genesis 25. Now that's a quick overview of the life of Abraham, but let's look especially at the promises of God to Abraham. The patriarchs were the initial channels through whom God's promises for the future were launched. The word promise emphasizes gift, which is something unsolicited rather than reward, which is something earned. We've already seen the divine command go, Find promises, five of them, the I wills of Genesis 12, 2 and 3, and the human response in Genesis 12, verse 4, so Abram left. We see the same emphasis upon God's promises in Genesis 13 and Genesis 15. We see the divine command look in Genesis 15, 5, the first half of the verse, and the divine promise in the second half of the verse, so shall your descendants be. The human response shows up in verse 6, where it says, and he believed the Lord. Abram believed the Lord, and he, the Lord, credited it, that is, Abraham's believing, or Abraham's faith, to him, to Abram, as righteousness. So we have a declaration of Abraham's righteousness before God because of the faith that Abraham had in the Lord, including his faith in Genesis 3.15, that God would one day send a Savior. David Klein's science cites 19 promises of descendants in Genesis, 13 of them directed to Abraham. 
He also mentions 13 promises of land in Genesis, nine of them directed to Abraham. Well, Abraham never possessed the land, at least not very much of it. He had God's promise, and that was enough for him. In fact, most of the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not fulfilled during the lifetime of the patriarchs. This, of course, prepares us for a fuller understanding of the concept of faith, being so critical in both Old and New Testaments. Even though we typically only hear about his faith, the life of Abraham was actually a combination of faith and folly, or faith and lack of faith. What sort of faith passes off one's wife as one's sister, not once, but twice? In Genesis 12, and then again in Genesis 20. In Egypt, Abraham used his wife Sarah to save his own life, but later in Philistia, he did the same. Does divine silence about this lack of faith imply divine approval? No, it certainly does not. It shows that God's promise to Abraham cannot even be avoided. The greatest threat to that promise is the bearer of the promise. Abram tells Abimelech, the king of Gerar, that after all, Sarah really is my sister. She is my half-sister. So I guess you could say Abram was only telling a half was a half lie, but he still was indicating a lack of trust in God. Two other incidents in the life of Abraham reveal his faltering steps in believing God's promises. Genesis 15, we read that Abraham prepared to adopt his servant Eliezer as his heir, apparently frustrated that God was not on his timetable to produce an heir for him. Then, in Genesis 16, verses 1 to 6, we read the sequel of the Hagar and Sarah story where Abraham accepted Sarah's suggestion to have an heir through Hagar, again showing Abraham's promise to trust, failure to trust in the promise of God. But Abraham was not always a man without faith. You see stories illustrating both faith and folly in Abraham. Here we arrive at the climax of the story of Abraham in Genesis 22 and the sacrifice of Isaac. After that story, we no longer see Abraham lacking faith. From that point on, he trusts God. These stories illustrate his faith. First, Abraham went with a minimum of direction and explanation. Go to the land I will show you, God said to Abraham in chapter 12. Direction is plain. Exact destination is unknown. Second, in the conflict with Lot, Abraham leaves his rights in God's hands. Sometimes getting along together within the family is more difficult than getting along with those outside the family. But he allows Lot to have his choice of the land. Third, in Genesis 14, a story of international strife, Abraham goes to war against the poor kings of Mesopotamia. God has said to him, those who curse you, I will curse. Will God keep that promise? This story answers that question with a resounding yes. At Sodom, Abraham rejects the spoils of war. Once only too eager to accept a gift from Pharaoh, Abraham has now learned to exercise restraint in accepting handouts. He's now seeking grace, not graft. In Genesis 15 and 17, we read about the Abrahamic co covenant. Genesis 15, 6 is the only place in Genesis where there is an explicit reference to faith. Genesis 17.5, we learn of the name change from Abram to Abraham, from exalted father to father of many. The new name broadens Abraham's experience with God. He is to be the father of many descendants, as God had promised. The mark of the covenant, circumcision, will be an ineradicable mark, later replaced in the New Testament era by baptism. Fifth, Genesis 18 and 19 tell the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham becomes the intercessor for the transgressor, trusting in the justice and judgment of God. Sixth, Abraham's prayers restore fertility to the wife of a pagan king in Genesis 20, a story not on your screen. It's ironic that his prayers don't work for Sarah, but then again God has his ways. Seventh, in Genesis 22, we read the dramatic story of Abraham's near sacrifice of his only son Isaac, the child of promise. 
Genesis 18 and 19, Abraham is talkative and audacious. Here, Abraham is silent, passive, following divine directions. This near sacrifice of Isaac is a testing. When Abraham nearly sacrifices Isaac, he prepares us for the Temple of Solomon that I mentioned moments ago. The climax appears in Genesis 21, 14. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. Excuse me, that should be Genesis 22, 14. He did not call the place Abraham has performed, but God will provide. Faith then is ultimately based on God's character and the reliability of his word. The eighth and last example of Abraham's faith appears in Genesis 24. Will the God who provided it, Moriah, also provide a work, a, a wife for Isaac? Abraham receives an unqualified yes. Rebecca, the wife of Isaac, is childless. As Sarah was earlier, and as is Rachel later on in Genesis. In contrast to both his father Abraham and son Jacob, Isaac's prayer for his wife results in Rebekah's pregnancy in Genesis 25, 21. Therefore, Eliezer does not need to be the heir of Abraham and Sarah. So this marriage between Isaac and Rebekah is going to provide them an heir. Prayer is doubly answered when Rebekah has twins. Grandfather Abraham would be 160 years old at their birth, 15 years yet to live, for he died at the age of 175. Having children is a great gift of God, not only because it provides someone to care for the parents in their old age in this ancient culture, but also because, theoretically, at this point in salvation history, any Jewish family could be the family to give birth to the Messiah. The theme of the younger son getting ahead of the older son, as in Jacob and Esau, Ephraim and Manasseh, Reuben and Judah, is not rare in the Old Testament. God has a way of upsetting all of our expectations. He sometimes does this by blessing the younger son ahead of the older son. So it appears in the Jacob story that comes to us, especially in Genesis 25 to 36, but carries almost all the way to the end. Genesis. God is not impressed with birth order and credentials, but with the condition of the heart. That theme appears especially in the Jacob Esau story. Jacob is the younger brother, born moments after his older brother Esau. The story is primarily about Jacob, who will continue the messianic line that will eventually result in the Savior. The story of Jacob can be outlined in the following way. First of all, the need for transformation. This shows up even in infancy. Jacob is a self-centered individual, for his name means he grasps the heel, and so he was grabbing Esau's heel as they were born. But those very same words that the name Jacob can be translated, he deceives. And so the name seems to have been given to predict a questionable lifestyle. According to Genesis 25, Esau may be a skillful hunter, but Jacob is a skillful opportunist and gets the birthright from Jacob and then later on deceives his own father in his old age when he is blind. With the help of his mother, Rebecca, gets the blessing of the firstborn from his father. To deliberately deceive one's own father, now senile and physically incapacitated, is to stoop even lower then he stooped when he got Esau's birthright. Isaac, the deceiver in chapter 26, has now become deceived. God's preparation of Jacob for transformation is recorded in Genesis 28 to 32. In Genesis 28, a number of episodes take place in Jacob's life before God enters the picture directly. God is not directly involved at first. The first contact with God comes at Bethel. Jacob's first impression of God is fear. We read Genesis 28, verse 17. Later on, Jacob is afraid of Laban, Genesis 31, 31, and Esau, Genesis 32, verses 7 and 11. It is the fear spawned by a guilty conscience. 
But Jacob finds divine friendship when he was lonely, divine forgiveness for his sins, and also divine purpose in chapter 28, verses 13 to 15. Then according to Genesis 29 to 31, ironically, Jacob spends the next 20 years living with someone a lot like himself, that is, his um uncle Laban. Even as Jacob had deceived his father, so also Laban deceives him by changing his wages so many times and even switching brides on the night of Jacob's wedding. Jacob doesn't like what he sees. Levi and Judah, the tribes that produced the priests and kings of Israel, were born of Leah. Leah. Ironically, this means that their origin can be traced to an unwanted marriage between Jacob and Leah. Old Testament scholar Gerhard von Rath comments, God's work descended deeply into the lowest worldliness. There was hidden past recognition. God so often does unusual things. The story of Jacob's transformation comes in Genesis 32, 22 to 31, which happens to be the Old Testament lesson for next Sunday. In that narrative, God, in the form of a man, wrestles with Jacob through the night at the Jabbok River until nearly dawn. There at a place that Jacob names, names Peniel, Peniel meaning the face of God, Jacob becomes aware of his weakness, his hunger for God, and his own unworthiness. The problem was his nature. Jacob, which means he deceives, deceiver. Well, what are the results of this wrestling match? First, Jacob gets a new name and a new character. He's named Israel, which means he struggles with God instead of Jacob. Deceiver. He gets a new power because verse 28 says, you have overcome. He gets a new blessing because in verse 29 it says that he blessed him there. He gets a new testimony because Jacob says, I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. And he gets a new start. Read in verse 31, the sun rose above him. And he gets a new reminder of his own human weakness. Also in verse 31, which tells us that he was limping because of his hip. The results of this transformation become apparent. Genesis 33, 1 to 36, 40. Before the wrestling match at Peniel, Jacob was in the rear of his company, all of his flocks and his family. But after Peniel, Jacob led the procession. If you look at chapter 33, verse 3, he took the beginning instead of at the end of his family and flocks. Therefore, he had acquired a new courage, but also a new humility that shows up in the second half of verse 3, chapter 33, and a new generosity that shows up in verses 10 and 11 of that same chapter. The story ends, according to Genesis 35, verse 29, when we learn that Jacob, excuse me, that Isaac was buried by his sons Esau, and Jacob. They are not at odds one another. They appreciate one another as brothers. Alienation has been replaced by proximity. They are brothers and friends once again. We now turn to the Joseph story, which is the eighth and last word of our eight-word outline, if you'll remember. Creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And so now we are in the last Eighth of the book of Genesis, Genesis 37 to 50. Ominous beginning to the Joseph story appears in Genesis 37, verse 3, where we read from the NIV, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age. He made a richly ornamented robe for him. Such favoritism would later cause huge problems for the family, Almost anyone who has lived in a family knows. If we think about the origin of the dreams of Joseph, we wonder, are they the result of Joseph's ambition, or were those dreams sent by God? And when the dreams are shared with his brothers and parents, are they shared out of enthusiasm or an immature brashness? However you answer the first question, dreams arose out of Joseph's favorite position in his father's eyes. Whether they came from Joseph's ambition or directly from God, they led to a number of bad experiences for Joseph, all of it caused at least in part by Jacob's favoritism. 
those bad experiences included being nearly killed by uh, by his brothers in chapter 37, being sold into slavery in a distant land a few verses later in verse 28, being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife in chapter 39, then being imprisoned in that same chapter in verse 20. Where was God in all of this? Why did he allow this to happen? These questions are asked by many people who face difficult circumstances. The answer, of course, in retrospect, is that God was at work to accomplish his purposes by placing Joseph in a position of influence that would later rescue both Jacob's family, all of Egypt, and much of the Mediterranean world from famine. Joseph learned a few things during those difficult times, including the importance of trusting in God. When he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, for example, Joseph disclaimed any innate ability. Verse 16 of chapter 41 says, I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. So he knew that it was God that was at work in his life, allowing him to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. Genesis 42 to 50. We learn that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Take a look at Romans 8.28, and you'll find Paul's beautiful expression of that idea. When Joseph's brothers came to Egypt to buy food, Joseph first accused them of being spies, Genesis 42, verse 9. Then he imprisoned them, same chapter, verses 15 to 17. But after that, he imprisoned just one of them, put their money back in their sacks, questioned whether or not they were thieves. Chapter 42, verses 18 and following. Finally, he put the silver cup the Benjamin's sack during the second trip to Egypt to buy food. That's in Genesis 44, verses 1 and following. And he threatened to make Benjamin a slave and let the rest go. But the question we might ask is, why did Joseph speak so harshly to his brothers on this occasion, on these occasions. Why did he treat them so brutally? The reason is very simple. Because rough words are redemptive words. Joseph's ultimate purpose was to restore his brothers. These harsh words were intended to discover whether or not his brothers had changed. Because, you see, Joseph and Benjamin were the two sons of Jacob that were also sons of Rachel. So they were full brothers. Joseph and Benjamin were half-brothers to all the other of the twelve sons of Jacob. So Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, and Zebulun were all half-brothers. Joseph, half-brothers to Benjamin. And so if these brothers had been willing to abandon their half-brother Joseph years before, Joseph's wondering, will they also abandon Benjamin, who is probably also father's favorite, discovers that they have changed, that they are different. So in chapter 50, verse 20, we read the words of Joseph, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, saving of many lives. Genesis 49 is Jacob's blessing of his sons before he died. Jacob is on his deathbed, and so you see the death of Jacob is recorded in the last, second last chapter of Genesis, and so Jacob's story does continue through almost the entire end of the story of Joseph, and he even shows up by name in the 50th chapter. But in Genesis 49, as Jacob is preparing to die, he gathers all of his sons around him, and blesses them before he dies. He has a few sharp words for some of them, particularly for Reuben, his firstborn son. Follow along in Genesis 49, verses 3 and 4. He says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. Jacob had high hopes for his firstborn son, but the reality shows up in verse 4. Turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel, for you went up onto your father's bed, onto my pouch, and defiled it. 
So Reuben had committed the sin of adultery with his father's own concubine. Therefore, the high hopes that Jacob had for Reuben met with the reality of Reuben's sin, and that's why the blessing of the firstborn passed not to Reuben, but to Joseph, whose two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, receive an inheritance later on in the land of Canaan. And so we see the double portion of the share of the firstborn. Many of our presidents and all of the initial astronauts involved in our space program were firstborn. And firstborn children typically are overachievers. As we come to the end of the book of Genesis, the promise of Genesis 49 verse 10 looms large. Jacob says, scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. That promise is explained in Ezekiel 21, 27 that the rulership that belongs to Judah, the preeminent tribe in Israel, will not be restored until he comes to whom it, that rulership, rightfully belongs. One to whom rulership or sovereignty truly belongs is the one who has, create, who has created all things, one who owns all things. Messiah Jesus Christ, who says in Matthew 28, that all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. As a result, the messianic line was transferred from Reuben to Judah, so that that promised Messiah would one day come from the tribe of Judah. Compare also the idea of coming in Zechariah 9, 9 and 10, your king comes to you with Mark 11, verse 9, blessed is he that comes. And Psalm 118, verse 26, he who comes. Words that are fulfilled on Palm Sunday. When Genesis 49, 10 speaks of the one who comes, it is a reference to the coming of the Messiah. Furthermore, reference to a lion that appears in this blessing on Judah, verses 8 to 12, becomes clearer when we read in Revelation 5, verse 5 describes Christ as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the strong and victorious. His ideal king, this messianic suffering servant, will come from the tribe of Judah and also from the family of David. Genesis 50, verse 20, is where Joseph says those words I mentioned a moment ago. He says to his brothers who are fearful that now that Jacob has died, Joseph will take his revenge on them. He says to them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Notice the phrase, the saving of many lives, in verse 20. Whose lives were meant by that phrase? Well, obviously Jacob and his family, all of them their descendants, but it also includes the Egyptians who were suffering from the very same famine. The promise to Abraham was being fulfilled. Genesis 12, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you. Some of the Egyptians had blessed the descendants of Abraham by caring for them, so they were blessed in return. So Jacob and his family, the Egyptians, and even many animals were among the lives that were saved as a result of God's plan for Joseph, those latter chapters of Genesis. Finally, we come to the very last slide, the last verse of the book of Genesis. So Joseph died at the age of 110. After they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Those concluding words set us up for the book of Exodus and the most important event in Old Testament history, the Exodus under Moses. That brings our quick survey of the book of Genesis to a close, and we'll take time now for some questions. So I turn it back over to Pastor Dale Christian. Okay. Um, so right now, uh, do I know that um, do anybody that's watching this online, uh, they're hearing me and um, not you so much. Um, hopefully. Um, yeah, go ahead and move it on. And, uh, hopefully they're doing it. And so what I'm going to do now is invite anybody 
we have questions here. Um, to offer those questions, I'm going to turn the microphone back over to you. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, um, as I, uh, as you hear the questions, um, to please reread or, or restate the question uh, so that anybody else um, that is watching can hear. I'm ready to write. Okay. Why, why is the book of Hebrews in a study on Genesis? Okay, excellent question. Why is the book of Hebrews in a study on Genesis? For a couple of reasons. Number one, the Old and the New Testament hit hand in glove with one another. In fact, some have said that the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. The New Testament lies hidden in the Old Testament. And so since both Testaments come from the hand of God, it would make sense for there to be a lot of correlation between uh, testaments. Secondly, for Genesis and Hebrews specifically, Melchizedek only appears in the Old Testament in Genesis, and Melchizedek is mentioned prominently in the book of Hebrews as a type of Christ or a pattern of priesthood that Christ himself imitates. But especially for the book of Hebrews, it's that 11th chapter where the author to the Hebrews there's quite a number of Old Testament saints who lived their lives by faith. And Abraham, of course, is the preeminent character of the Old Testament who lived their life by faith. So that 11th chapter of Hebrews is just full of references to the Old Testament. It's almost impossible for me to teach Genesis without the amount of Hebrews in time. Why does sin keep on going instead of that one sin? Oh, we have to, pardon? Okay. Yes, uh, we are talking about the nature of sin as being something, but we have to define what sin is, and you can spell sin in two different ways, sin with a capital S, or sins with a small s and an S on the end, plural. The second sense of the term, sins, describe wrong things that we do. And that's one problem, but the greater problem is the capital S-I-N. Sin is a corruption of human nature. And if two corrupt human beings, a man and a woman, an Adam and Eve, uh, give birth to a child, that child is going to carry the same physical human nature and unfortunately for us also the same spiritual human nature. So sin is something that is passed on from generation to generation, as we sometimes say, the reason I'm a sinner is because my parents were sinners. It doesn't mean that I can blame them for the things that I do wrong, but it does illustrate the fact that sin nature is passed on from generation to generation. My take on Neanderthals. Yeah, I've done a little bit of reading on that recently, although I haven't uh, read a great deal on that subject. But <clears throat> I have uh, read some opinions that think that the Neanderthal skeletons are actually fully human skeletons. They are not uh, transitional forms between apes and men, but that their skulls were actually larger than ours. They probably had a larger brain capacity than we do, but that some of those skeletons seem to have been uh, 
affected by disease as they got older and caused a, a larger brow above the eye, for instance. But uh, there, there's no evidence that the Neanderthal man was a transition of one half to eight half human. It's very likely that they were fully human. Now, if any of those questions come by Twitter or Facebook, we'll just pass them on to me verbally, right? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, I can tell you. The question is about the Sanford book on genetic entropy in the human genome. Uh, Sanford is a top flight scholar on human genetics, and uh, which is good and bad. It's good in the sense that we have somebody who really knows what he's talking about regarding the human genome. But it's bad in, in that I'm not a scientist, and so I don't fully understand what he is saying. I did read the book, and if I understand him correctly, and I actually have heard him speak also, so I'm confident that this accurately reflects his position, that there is a significant number of harmful mutations passed on from generation to generation, and each each generation passes on a number of others. Uh, the, the most modest estimate is 100 harmful mutations per generation. But Sanford himself thinks it's as many as 600 harmful um, mutations per generation. And so if you, if you know how many mutations happen in each generation, and you look at the human genome and can determine how many mutations there are in the human genome that are harmful, then you can reckon backwards to the date when this genome was originally perfect, and we know that Adam and Eve were created originally perfect. And Sanford is suggesting that the human race is thousands of years old rather than millions of years old. So he would hold to the very recent creation of Adam and Eve, a young Adam and Eve. What is, okay, if, if the world or the universe is only thousands instead of millions of years old, uh, what, what is the reason for that? What is, is the question, what is the evidence for that? Or, is, or, okay, well, there's a lot of evidence for that. In fact, uh, there are over a hundred methods for determining the age of the earth. And over 90% of them are unambiguously evidence for young Earth. For instance, the, the rate of sedimentation in the ocean, the amount of sediment accumulating in the bottom of the ocean, uh, the rate at which the, the moon is receding from the Earth, uh, the rate at which the electromagnetic field around the Earth is deteriorating, uh, those are three of them. And 90% of them are unambiguously young Earth, show a young Earth. And the other 10%, like carbon-14, potassium, argon, uranium, dating methods, are disputed. And in fact, there has been some research done recently where samples of coal and samples of diamonds were submitted 
by a third party to one of the most precise uh, mass spectrometers in the world, one located in Europe. And uh, the results came back with significant levels of carbon-14 present in both the coal and the diamonds. And let me explain that a little bit more. Carbon-14 atoms are undetectable in any product or sample that is 100,000 years old or more. So if you submit coal samples, and they submitted 10 different coal samples to this uh, lab that are supposed to be between the ages of 30 million and 300 million years old, and they, they picked these samples of coal from all different parts of the so-called geological column, and all of the coal samples came back with significant levels of carbon-14, comparable to an age of thousands of years old, six, seven, eight thousand years old, rather than millions. And the youngest sample was supposed to be only, was supposed to be at least 30 million years old. So there shouldn't be a single molecule of carbon-14 in any of these samples, and yet they all returned about the same amount of carbon-14. And uh, the same thing was true when they submitted diamond samples. Now, diamonds, according to evolutionary thinking, are supposed to come from the early foundation forming of the Earth. So they were supposed to be one to three billion years old. And a diamond should not have a single atom of carbon-14 in it either. But they submitted these crushed diamond samples and they were tested. And diamonds also showed that they had levels of carbon-14 that were consistent with several thousand years of age instead of millions or hundreds of millions or even billions. So that's some of the evidence for the Earth being thousands of years old rather than millions or billions of years old. And if uh, somebody wants to come back and ask a question in, in another way, why do people still hold for that position, I can address that as well. But at least that answers the question in the way that we submitted it. Why do we as Christians care about the age of the earth? Okay. Um, well, there are a number of reasons, and, and one of them is because a lot of those that hold to an ancient earth have a, an ulterior motive. Evolutionary theory, since uh, Charles Darwin formulated it in The Origin of Species in 1859, has been a way in which an atheist or an agnostic can account for the existence of the universe without having to resort to the belief in the existence of God. So for the first time they had a theory that was somewhat intellectually respectable, and so a lot of people grab onto that because it's a way of explaining existence without uh, believing in God, and God has a way of holding us accountable for our sins, and they don't want that. Another reason why we should care, it's going to depend to an extent on our own hermeneutics, our own method of interpreting the Bible, the regard with which we hold the scriptures. If we believe the scriptures to be the inspired word of God, and we believe that the Bible is able to be understood by a 10 year old child as, as much as a 50 year old PhD in microbiology, for instance. Uh, and we hold the scripture in high regard, then the straightforward message of the scripture is unambiguously clear. Then the early chapters of Genesis are history, and it's usually those chapters are reinterpreted as legend by people who have already concluded that God couldn't have created the universe in the recent past. And one last reason, and I'll close with this one, that the testimony of the New Testament writers, all including the words of Jesus, are unanimously in favor of a, an earth that was created in this past. As God says, as Jesus says in Matthew 19, this is the one look up Matthew 19, for example, he does say the same thing in Luke 18, Mark 10. Jesus says in Matthew 19, verse 4, have you read 
but at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female. So Jesus says God created male and female at the beginning. According to evolutionary theory, the universe was 10 billion years old before the Earth was born, and the Earth is four and a half billion years old. Human beings only arrived on the scene for a couple of million years ago, or even less than that. So if that theory is true, then uh, God didn't create male and female at the beginning, and then Matthew is wrong, and in fact, Jesus, or well, one of the two is wrong, either Jesus is wrong, I think Matthew recorded his words correctly, or Matthew is wrong, or both. So it, it's a matter of taking both Old Testament and New Testament, the word, and especially the words of the gospel, and the of Jesus and so Okay, thank you. Another excellent question. The question is, given the breadth of the universe and God's universal power, what are the chances that there is another universe out there? I would say that the chances are relatively slim that there's another universe or another uh, solar system in which there is intelligent life or human life on it. Now, it could be that C.S. Lewis years ago speculated that perhaps the vast distances of space are God's method of quarantining sent on Earth to make sure that the sin uh, that exists in our own world isn't able to contaminate a population or a species in another part of our galaxy or in, a, in another galaxy. But uh, as I read the scriptures and I've read the Bible from cover to cover more than a dozen times, I don't find any anywhere in the scriptures that God created another set of creatures, human beings, or non-human creatures anywhere else in the universe. And there is also some recent evidence that I heard about this summer that suggests that rather than the universe being random and that there being no center to the universe, there is some new evidence that suggests that the galaxies seem to be placed in concentric circles and that the Earth and our solar system and the Milky Way are, are very close to the center of the universe. So maybe that's a, an indication of God's plan available for people to discover in the 21st century, an indication that, that we are central in some sense. Finally, I guess it, it doesn't matter a great deal there's nothing in scripture that prohibits the possibility of there being human civilization in another galaxy. There's also nothing in scripture that teaches that either. So we have to leave it an open question. Yes. Yes. Well, the question, okay, the question is about Methuselah and the date of his death, and according to the chronology of Genesis um, 5, in particular, 5 and 6, it is, it is true that Methuselah died in the year that the flood began. So the question is, did Methuselah die as a result of the flood, or did he die for some other reason? Now, I, I can't say with certainty, because the text doesn't answer the question. And uh, one thing that Lutherans typically do is to say what the scripture says and try not to say more than what it says, try not to say less than what it says. So, uh, in my opinion, it wasn't the flood that caused him to die but that he died in the year of the flood before the flood came. The fact that he lived that old may be an indicator that he lived a righteous life. In fact, his father was a guy named Enoch. And if you read Genesis 5, you discover that Enoch is 
one of the two individuals, Elijah being the other one in the Old Testament, who never died. At least that's the best reading of Genesis 5, verse 24. It says, Enoch walked with God, and he was no more because God took him away. I don't know about you, but if I had a father who was so godly that God decided he wasn't going to have to die, he was just going to take him directly to heaven, I think that would leave an impression on me. So my best guess is that Methuselah lived a godly life, and he died in the year of the flood, not because of the flood, not as a God's judgment upon the world, but simply died earlier in that year before the flood waters came. But that's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Not to happen. So, shall I answer that question? Yes, I'll be, I'll be happy to. My tenth book came out this summer. It's called The History and Literature of the Old Testament, and it is an introduction to the Old Testament that I use in my Old Testament courses. Some of the early books I wrote, the first one was published in 1984 called Make Disciples. It was a book about evangelism programs of the 80s. And uh, written several books on evangelism, a new number of assimilation to Concordia Publishing House. And I do have a, a short book, a booklet, that uh, is underway. I've actually completed the draft of it for Concordia Publishing House. It will come out next spring, probably. It's called In the Beginning, God. And it is a study of Genesis 1, the creation account, particularly for lay people. So I have intended to write it at a very popular level rather than a technical, uh, linguistic, or theological level. The CPA should release, release that uh, next spring or summer. And there are several others I've written a book on. Okay, um, so just to uh, wrap things up, um, I want to remind everybody, uh, both here and away, oh, I'm sorry, one more question? It was Libraries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> I don't have my volume. Hold on. <sighs> okay. Um, just wrapping up, uh, I'd like to... Um, First of all, thank uh, Dr. Heck for his presentation. Um, and um, and I really appreciate uh, all the great information. I'd like to invite everybody, uh, both here and um, anybody who's listening online or who will watch this later, uh, to come by our website, shepherdoftheridge.org. Find the Genesis study. It's in the Bible studies uh, menu at the top of the page. And, uh, and, and join us. We're going to continue this discussion uh, online over the next uh, few months. We're going to have a, um, a Sunday night starting next week, the 17th, a Sunday night study at 7 o'clock Eastern. And uh, we will be streaming the discussion live. Anybody that's here present um, will also be invited to join us in the discussion and uh, through the, the chat box and we will have discussion forums on the website. They're already there, actually, so if you have any other additional questions or comments, you can go and, and post them there. And uh, covering just all different uh, angles, besides there's a lot of, so it seems to be a lot of age of the earth sort of questions, but um, any there's lots of other things to cover, obviously, uh, for the book of Genesis, and so we're going to cover all of that. And... Um, and even once it's going to be broken down into 24 uh, lessons, and then but we will have additional lessons online that just we couldn't fit into that uh, 24 section. Uh, so people are invited to participate in those, and that discussion can go on uh, even after we're done with the 24. If, as people have additional 
uh, comments or questions that we'll keep that up on the website to continue uh, that discussion there. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody who, uh, who tuned in today from uh, all over the place. I'd love to also, if you go to our website, shepherdtheridge.org, uh, go to that Genesis page, there's a comments thing. We'd love to hear where you're coming from. I know there's a church in Florida that is, uh, that's watching us there. And, um, and I, I'm not sure where other people are, are watching from, so I invite you to, uh, to just go and leave a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. It'd be interesting to see all the different places we were able to reach out to today. So, uh, Dr. Heck, thank you very much uh, for your presentation today, and, all right, and we hope to see everybody um, online. All right. God be with you all.